Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for uh, being here. Um, I have maybe 30 minutes, but I'm trying to really finish within 25 minutes to allow some time for questions, and because I really need to hear from you more than I talk to you. So uh, the title, as uh, you can see, is Can Code Biology Enhance Bilinguistics? Uh, I mean, it's uh, questions of this sort admit normally of a, a simple uh, answer, yes or no. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, not the case here. I, uh, I, uh, my talk will not uh, have a short answer to this question I, because I need to explore the territory between bilinguistics and uh, code biology. And um, uh, more specifically, I would like to uh, compare the syntax view of language with the code view. And I will start with bilinguistics first. So I have to introduce some of uh, theoretical linguistics. It's the field from I, uh, where I come from. So I will start first with um, uh, bilinguistics. I mean, bilinguistics, of course, uh, if I talk about bilinguistics, I mean Chomsky and bilinguistics. This is, of course, doesn't mean that bilinguistics is only restricted to, to the Chomsky approach. No, I mean, just because this is my speciality, so I'm just talking now about bi bilinguistics uh, in uh, a Chomsky sense. However, maybe later on I will talk about bilinguistics uh, in general. Now, bilinguistics historically started with uh, Chomsky work. And, uh, I mean, uh, we have uh, his uh, 1965 aspects of the theory of syntax, and then with Lindbergh, and uh, it's a view which, which it's an approach which views language as a, a biological capacity rooted in uh, evolution. Uh, also, it, it looks at language as, as a natural object, uh, as a, a mental uh, organ uh, of the uh, brain. Of course, this is only a metaphor. Uh, bilinguistics if we, it deals with several problems, but here I will talk about uh, two key problems within bilinguistics, which is the problem of language uh, acquisition, known in the literature as, the, as Plato's problem, and then I will talk about the problem of language evolution, also known uh, in the literature as uh, uh, Darwin's uh, problem. As to the problem of language acquisition, the schema here, you have the linguistic input, and then you would have the, the child, not really the child, the brain of the child, and then you have a, a linguistic uh, output. If you notice the, the circle there is bigger than this, just to give the idea that uh, the child actually uh, his linguistic output is, is greater than his linguistic input. The linguistic input uh, here means, that, uh, you know, the, the linguistic, we call it in linguistic, linguist, uh, the primary linguistic data of the child, his linguistic environment. Now, this is, of course, is uh, uh, formulated according to the poverty of the stimulus argument. Uh, uh, this is we find in Chomsky 1980. And uh, it's an argument which, uh, uh, tries to show that uh, uh, much of what children know about uh, their language goes far beyond what ling their uh, linguistic environment actually justifies. Now, of course, this is a claim. I'm not saying that this is the case. I'm just trying to give an introduction to this. Uh, then, as an example, just to give you an example, a simple example that actually Chomsky himself used in his famous debate with Jean Biaget in 1975, that this is the exact example he used in, in that debate. Uh, it, it, it actually concerns the, the structure-dependent property. And if you look at this, for example, simple sentence in English, the man is here. Now, you have two ways of analyzing the sentence. You can go word by word or you can actually go phrase by phrase. Now, if you go word by word, of course, you, you are going, the man is here. And that's relevant to the order of the, uh, 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 the, 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 the parts of the sentence, the order. Because in communication, it's important the order, which, which comes first. Now, if you analyze it by uh, uh, phrase by phrase, then it's hierarchy. It's not order anymore. So it's, it's a different uh, consequence, which analysis you use. Now, a relevant question here, from the point of view of language acquisition, is 
which analysis is the child following uh, for uh, informing the following transformation? Which, which is exactly, is it word by word? or is it actually phrase by phrase? So this is a question that we might ask. Now we can formulate, of course, hypothesis about uh, this kind of question. For example, we can say, well, hypothesis one, probably is computational as such, uh, process the declarative from left to right, word by word, until reaching the first auxiliary and transport it to the left. So you would go, the man is, and you found the is. You shift it to the beginning of the sentence to form the is, the man is. This is word by word analysis. Now, if we do this, actually the hypothesis predicts the right outcome, which is true. Is the man here? This is how you formulate the question in English. Now, as the second hypothesis, you would say, same as hypothesis one, but select the first auxiliary following the first noun phrase of the declarative, not the first auxiliary per se, but after the first noun phrase. So you would go, the man, there is no auxiliary, but finish the first part. Then you found it, then you shift it. Again, we have the same hypothesis actually predicting the same outcome. So the conclusion here is actually the two hypotheses seemingly are the same. We cannot distinguish between them. But if we think here a little bit with the sentence, the original sentence, and here we have the man who is the man who is tall is here. Rather than saying the man is here, we would say the man who is tall is here. Now let's see how uh, each hypothesis fair. Hypothesis one: we go word by word. We found the auxiliary. We shift it to the uh, left, and here we go. Is the man who tall is here? Wrong. The prediction is wrong because this is not a grammatical sentence in English. Now, if we go to the second hypothesis, we have the man who is tall is here. You go over the first uh, phrase and then you shift any auxiliary you find after the first, which is this one. So you shift it and you get is the man who is tall here. And that's the right prediction. So here we can distinguish actually between the two. Now, which hypothesis is the, uh, the more complex one? Of course, hypothesis two, because hypothesis two is same as hypothesis one, and then you go on to specify further. So the conclusion that Chomsky reaches here is even though hypothesis two is more complex, the child still obey its uh, structural constraints without any instruction. What it means this? It means when we look at the primary linguistic data, we don't find the child making mistakes like this. So if he doesn't make, if he or she doesn't make mistake like this, then where did this knowledge of this processing come from? That's that, that's the original argument. Now, of course, uh, what Chomsky now, how he formulated the problem of language acquisition based in this example and several many other examples, um, how is it possible for language to arise in the individual? So we are talking about the individual now. Later, when we talk about language evolution, we talk about the species. But now, as to language acquisition, how is it possible for language to arise in the individual? Can I get some water, please? Now, the solution for this is, of course, Chomsky in 1979, um, write this, we must postulate an innate structure that is rich enough to account for the disparity between experience and knowledge. We have to have a, a genetic endowment that is rich enough to account for this. That is his basic, thank you. Uh, so now we move on to the problem of language uh, evolution, which is uh, known uh, in the literature as Darwin's problem. In 2008, many actually in us in the field, I remember asking why Chomsky is talking about language evolution? Because before he never did, or at least in passing, but not really concentrating in language evolution. And here it seems that why, because when he actually started talking about principle and parameters, he stopped at the principle themselves and he asked, where do the principles of language come from? The principles themselves. Now, if they are part of the genetic endowment, then they had to evolve somehow. But not a lot could have evolved because it is too recent in evolutionary terms, of course, it's too recent. So what evolved in that short period of time 
cannot have been very complex. So here we have a conclusion in the language acquisition that something should be complex. But then if you move on to language evolution, it's kind of, no, it shouldn't. So how do you, I formulated actually in 2014 as, as this. How is it possible for a biological system such as a human language to have both an apparent structural complexity and a recent evolutionary history? So um, this is, this is how you formulate language evolution. There is a problem, and we have to account for this complexity. Of course, the, 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 what here only we have proposal and assumptions, and I will just show you what sort of uh, proposal and assumption we have here. First, uh, we should shift the burden of explanation from genetic endowment to general principle that are not specific to language. So Chomsky was using genetic endowment as a, a, an explanant, no? And now it's an explanandum itself. This is the object of explanation now. We have to explain it itself. Rather than solving a language acquisition by uh, uh, recourse to, to uh, uh, genetic endowment, now genetic endowment itself is the object of uh, explanation. Now, how we do this? Of course, Chomsky now is going beyond, our, or, and the followers of Chomsky, of course, I'm, I'm not just quoting Chomsky, uh, they, are, they are trying to go beyond biology, basically, into physics. This is exactly the, 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 the aim. So here we have pronouncement like this, for example, language is a well-designed, or is well-designed or optimal, unlike other objects of the biological world. So here we have, we see a, a, a kind of divorce between uh, linguistics and biology. Unlike uh, other objects of the biological world, it can be regarded as a direct consequence of the working of the laws of physics. Now, this is, of course, I, I, it's a big claim, I think, and I, 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 I spend a lot of time um, criticizing this in a full chapter in 2014 about it, because the, the pronouncement is just too high, uh, too, too, too good to, to be true. I mean, so, so uh, this is another thing I want to stop. Uh, so the only aspect of language that is uniquely human and uniquely linguistic is recursion. Why is this? Because you remember what we said about genetic endowment. We have to reduce its size. So reduce it to F to, until we just you get recursion. So genetic endowment doesn't really have anything as as content, except probably recursion, which is a mathematical function. And here is a computational mechanism that gives rise to the property of discrete infinity. And this is discrete infinity what defines language in Chomsky. Now, of course, this is the paper, uh, the Hauser and uh, 2002. It was published in Science and famous by now. Now, the apparent complexity of language is an epiphenomenon of the interaction between the gen genetically determined capacity of recursion and general principle of nature. So we have simplicity, we have a minimal search, we have all these principles that we find in the literature trying to connect the laws of physics with uh, uh, the rules of language. Now, problems, as I see, them and I, as others, see them with uh, bilinguistics. Uh, first of all, lack of a neurocomputational model. If you notice the name, Fitch, is, uh, he actually was one of the co authors of the paper of 2002, so uh, with Chomsky. Fitch is saying, despite a long history of trying, even circuits whose structure is already known in detail have proved remarkably resistant to abstract computation analysis. So even, even at this level, it's really hard to find a model uh, with this respect, to, to connect language with the brain, a computational model. Also, we have a problem of, of counter evidence. And this is also a problem I discussed at length somewhere else. The recursion only hypothesis, unique to language, I mean, if you, if you look at the literature, recursion is everywhere. Yeah. I mean, uh, there is a huge body of literature, which I actually reviewed, arguing for the presence of recursion outside the syntax of a human language and in nature at large. I mean, it, it, it just can't be, you know? And that's why when Chomsky responded to this idea of recursion only hypothesis, he would, well, if recursion is everywhere, maybe the, maybe the genetic 
genetic um, instruction to use recursion is uh, genetically. So it's really a way of trying to um, not to respond, but to go over the, 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 the real question here. So I don't think this is uh, reliable. Also, and this is a huge problem also, is the unfalsifiability. Because if you look at the philosophical part of the literature within minimalism, for example, which is the latest framework within linguistics, you would see the, something called the Galilean style. And what is this Galilean style? Of course, Galileo was portrayed as an anarchist, sometimes as a, as a methodologist, as, sometimes as a, an experiment. I mean, you name it. Everybody looking Galileo and to try to find some way of, of, of saying, yes, I have, I, have, I have Galileo behind, so I'm doing the right methodology. And I think this is kind of naive because, I mean, the way you look at it, I mean, uh, there are scholars of Galileo. Uh, who actually wrote about the many faces of Galileo in the literature. So it's not a uh, Finiciaro, I think one of them, uh, an Italian scholar. So the Galilean style basically is primacy of theory over data. So you come with an evidence, you said your, your theory is wrong. You said, no, theory first. Maybe, maybe you didn't collect the evidence well. Maybe you didn't see well. Maybe, and like this, you will never discredit anything. And this is really harmful. I think it's, this is really harmful to science. If we have, I understand in physics, sometimes we get a quotation out of context and said, Einstein said this, or I don't know who said this, but that is not really how it's, unless you have an evidence where you can actually, I'm not saying get rid of your theory, but at least reconsider your theory. This is really important, I think. Now, um, Circular explanation, I, I mean, I also wrote about this, but just basically, I would, uh, it's really detailed, but I will just go over it quickly. Uh, if you look at the literature within theoretical linguistics, we have the cognitive system, we call it thought system, where they are actually constrain how language, basically uh, the, the syntax, the syntactic part, is trying to produce something to which the cognitive uh, uh, system responds. Now, the problem is here is that the way to reduce the genetic endowment and therefore to the, genet the, 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 the syntax itself to reduce it is to say this property of language is there because the cognitive system requires it. Fine. But then you can say if the cognitive system requires this, then this is what you will get. That's fine. But then you ask a question, what evidence do we have that this property actually exists. Now, the argument, typical argument in the literature, because if we don't have this property, the cognitive system will crash, which is meaning does not require it. So this is, if you look at it, it's actually logically equivalent. If B, then Q is equivalent to, if not Q, then not B. And with this, you can explain anything. And as Karl Popper said, you know, if you explain anything, you explain nothing. So if you have this argument, you can apply it anywhere. Now I come to the field, your field. Uh, and I have things to say. I have, I must say, before I go into this, I must say, I, I spent uh, maybe 20 years in this field, in my field, theoretical linguistics, but I ended up with a lot of frustrations. And that's normal, you know, it's sometimes you hope and then you end with frustration. Now I'm looking at cold biology by accident. I read Barberi's book and it was really a moment of uh, excitement. And then of course, uh, after excitement comes hope, but where there is a hope, there is always a doubt also. So uh, I, 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 I feel like I have to look at it also with a critical eye. So I, I, I will just look at it and trying to comment and see the consequences for biolinguistics if the hypothesis, uh, the four hypotheses of the semantic theory of language uh, are true. So now we are not into code biology in general, but we are in the relevant part of code biology, which is the semantic theory of language. Uh, four hypotheses as uh, explained by Barbieri 2020. Now, the first hypothesis is this. The adapters of language, adapter of language in this case, are, of course, you know, the abductive uh, neural network. The adapters of language do not generate the rules of language. They merely allow children to interpret those rules. 
Okay, if this is true, then we have consequences. One of them for bilinguistics, namely Chomsky and bilinguistics. There is no innate mechanism such as universal grammar. There is no uh, language ad 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 acquisition device, no faculty of language. I mean, you name it. All this mechanism out. And I doubt, you know, if, if, if this could happen in bilinguistics after all these years. I doubt it. It's not easy to convince them to take off all these things. You know? But anyway, yeah. just to tell you what the consequences are. Now, code biology is incompatible with Chomsky linguistics. And I really feel now that, yeah, yes, I mean, if you take out all these things, it's incompatible. And doesn't mean incompatible with the results it's trying to reach. It's incompatible from the assumption. Starting from the assumption is incompatible. So, so it's incompatible with uh, Chomsky linguistics. However, I, it's perfectly compatible with uh, usage-based linguistics. Because in usage-based linguistics, like Tomasello and others, you see, you name it in, in the literature, they are actually, they, they, their assumptions are, 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 are in agreement with, with the, what I read in, in Barbieri's uh, work. So there is no problem, seems there, you know? So even if it's incompatible with Chomsky and bilinguistics, it doesn't mean incompatible with bilinguistic in general, no. Now, here a concern, just, just I mention it uh, in passing. Which rules of language do we mean in the hypothesis? The hypothesis, the adopter of language, do not generate the rules of language. What rules of language? As a linguist, I have to ask this question. What rules do you mean? Which rules? External rules of communication, order, as we said in the beginning, word by word. Or do you mean internal rules of thought? This is different. This is hierarchy. So we need to know this because this is important. Now, I go to the second hypothesis, which is this. Oh, I'm not taking time. Good. Um, the cultural codes change because their rules are produced by societies that continuously change. The biological codes do not change because their rules are produced by adopters that are highly conserved in evolution. Now, consequences. No parametric uh, variation, because you know in bilinguist champion bilinguist param parameters, the concept of parameters is very important still even now. I mean, even after since the 80s, still the parametric uh, variation still are there. So if you say that the rules are actually changing because society are changing, so this has nothing to do with parametric, uh, uh, parametric at least as they in, 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 uh, conceived in, 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 in uh, Chomsky and linguistics. So there is no parametric uh, variations. Now, and here is, I feel, I sense there is a problem. Hypothesis two seems to imply that linguistic variation is unconstrained by the human brain. That is, any conceivable language is possible for their brain to process. To process. I, I'm not sure if this is the case, but this is what seems to me at least. And if this is true, because this is exactly opposite to what we uh, see in Chomsky linguistics, there is no, uh, there is no, uh, not every language is possible. There are impossible languages that the brain cannot compute. But not only this, now we have a problem. Language evolution, even if culturally based, even if culturally based, is shaped by our thought processes like an other for, of uh, cognitive uh, limitation. This is by Chris Janssen and China. They have a wonderful paper about this, how actually language is shaped by the brain. There are constraints. You can't just compute anything. So if it's culturally based and it changes through societies, it's not only society as a factor. There are other factors that should be in, uh, put into consideration. Now I go to hypothesis, hypothesis three, which is language evolved. This is about now language uniqueness. Three and four, I think that they all relate to one aspect of the uniqueness of language. Hypothesis three said language evolved exclusively in our species because only human beings uh, go through an extremely long period of extrauterine fetal development. Now, human altruciality, uh, there are people who are skeptical about it in the literature, of course. Doesn't mean they are right, but I'm saying there are people who are skeptical about it, like uh, Downsworth, for example. And this is something I, I need to 
to look at, you know, to see whether this is true, because it's amazing, actually. What Barbieri explained in his book and in his uh, also uh, articles, it's just incredible how this uh, symmetry between how the, the, the heart developed and how the brain developed, there is kind of symmetry between the two. So when you look at it, you see whether Oh, normal, as any researcher would say, does anybody agree on this or no? It's interesting, you know, it's not to go, you know, full heart. It's not a religion after all, it's just science. So I'm trying to see, okay, whether other people disagree. This is interesting. So I found like, not only Downs for, there are others, but Downs were, for example, said human altruciality has been exaggerated, he thinks. And he's saying, the more we learn about other primates, the less outstanding in this regard we are. And then he add, most chimpanzee brain growth occurs postnatally too. So this is really crucial about uh, uh, for the brain to develop uh, after uh, the period of gestation. This is crucial. So if, if it's true about chimpanzee, this is kind of problematic for hypothesis three. Now, here is a problem. I don't think it's a problem. Just a, it's something that I, I really would like to discuss it with you because I feel I feel that I have to write it down when I was trying to uh, bring this, um, I mean, uh, in doing this uh, presentation. I, I put it this way. I, it's okay. I put it this way. Uh, so, uh, suppose, suppose that we found an un a non-human species with a period of extrauterine fetal development similar in length to that of humans. Would it be reasonable to suggest that, that language should have also evolved in this uh, species? Now, if you say yes, yes, it is reasonable, then you sh the burden of explanation on you to say why it didn't, why it didn't evolve, if it's reasonable. If you say it's not reasonable, then why extra uterine fetal development is a factor in the first place? I don't know if you see the argument or not, but I, I'm, I, 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 I'm trying to say that it, it seems there's something problematic as I see it here. Maybe I'm wrong, and I really wish to be wrong here, but I, I just am raising a point here. No, I'm throwing it, but I don't know whether it's true or not, because either it's a factor or it's not a factor. If it's not a factor, why, sh why, why should we consider it as a factor? And if it is a factor, you should explain then why it didn't actually evolve in other... Uh, given that the factor is present. Finally, I go to hypothesis four, which is language is a modeling system that makes a, a massive use of symbols, and this makes it fundamentally different from all other animal communication systems. Okay, now this hypothesis is actually a fact, huh? a fact that is not disputed by cognitive science. I mean, including bilinguistics. We look at it as a modeling system, that's true. Whether it's relevant for our study or not, that's a different question, but it is a modeling. Nobody disputing the symbolism of language, of course. Now, in human language, yes, it's an abstract symbolic uh, uh, code, but symbolism does not seem enough to distinguish language from non-human uh, uh, communicative system. It does not seem enough. And I think probably Barbieri would agree on this. Now, language, is a coded communication, and this is according to Tomasello here, language, and maybe this point is relevant to Professor Prince. I think today uh, one of the audience raised uh, a point about uh, cappuccino. Gee. Yes, yeah, that's, a, that's a, I think it's relevant, I think. Language is a coded communication that is based on uncoded communication, common conceptual. I'll give you an example. Look at dietic uh, terms in, in language. Like, for example, pronouns, I, you, uh, or, or adverbs, yesterday, tomorrow. You can't get an inference from language and decode this. You need a context. You can't. And this is no way you can say, encode it, the information, because it's depending on context and it's unlimited, this context. If I say you, it could be you when I talk to you. Tomorrow it would be you to, to somebody else. If I say you, and no way you can encode this at all. Because dietic uh, terms are there for a reason. It economizes the speech. Imagine every time I would say, yeah, I, I would say, Fahad Rashid al Muteri wants something. Like, you can't, you know, you have to, to, to say I, and that's it. So dietic there for a reason. 
dietic terms for a reason. But to encode them, they are uncoded communication. They themselves are encoded communication. So there is no way you have a space where you say, that's it, I can just go over the data and find all the relevant information. You can't. Now, of course, what Tomasello said, this is our common conceptual ground, shared intentionality. Of course, this is between speakers. Now, this, I find, seems to fit well with viewing humans as code makers. That goes really well with code biology in this point. Because if it's all about us who are actually encoding this, that goes well. But only with respect to the external rules of communication, again, not with internal rules of thought. We have internal rules of thought where I know some of you may be asked, what internal, what do you mean? Yeah, there we have. I mean, if you go to theoretical linguistics and you see, for example, we have we deal with 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 aspect of language where you find, for example, WH movement. More for example, you have a, a, a space, a gap, and then the, that that uh, word will shift to the left. For example, John ate an apple. What did John eat? So John ate an apple. This is what moved. Now, is it constrained or not constrained? Is there are, uh, co yes, of course, it, there is constraint in, in different contexts. If I say, I wonder whether John crashed the car, I can't say, uh, what did I wonder whether John crashed? You can't take the what here. But why? That's an interesting question. Why you can take sometimes what from its place and sometimes you cannot? There are constraints. And this is where it's all to do with hierarchy. It doesn't do, it has nothing to do with order. Now, finally, and here I think I finish, I just summarize in general uh, between the two views of language, the syntax view of language and the code view of language. Uh, with respect to language acquisition, we have language acquisition device LAD, which uh, rightly so uh, Barbieri said that just, there is no evidence that it exists, and it's true, there is no evidence that it exists. It's only theoretical so far. And principle and parameters were, uh, of course, the theory since the 80s. Now, with, with the code of view, we have abductive neural network and culturally created rules. This is how you explain language acquisition. Uh, language variation, we have different parametric setting and possible language, possible. So there are impossible languages. But with changing human society, we have changing rules according to the code view of language. Then linguistic environment, we have the primary linguistic data as we refer to it, and this is secondary because genetic endowment comes first. But with code uh, view of language, we have human community, speech community, and it's primary. Now, finally, language uniqueness. Uh, we have recursion, of course, and optimality, in, in not in the theory of phonology, but optimality as, as a concept, uh, and biologically atypical. Uh, so it's not really any biological system language. And uh, in terms of the code uh, view of language, we have unique fetal development and unique modeling system. So, can code biology help enhance? Uh, I finished. This is the last slide. I finished. Can so can code biology help enhance bilinguistics? Probably yes. But this would require, among other things, many things, an enormous revision of current Chomsky and bilinguistics, or, and this is really, I think it's important, I would love to contribute to the second one, uh, a cooperation between code biology and cognitive science in general and usage-based uh, usage uh, approaches to bilinguism in particular. I think this area needs to be, to be, to be uh, done. And then, final comment, and I will, won't explain it because I have no time. The general problem, as I see it, is this. What seems able to capture the essence of language is not scientific enough. And what seems to be scientific enough does not seem able to capture the essence of language. Thank you very much. Well, I suppose we have time for one. Maximum two questions. One question? Anyone? I just put this one. Okay. No? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you mean with scientific? Because this is a, an important point. With scientific, what I mean? Yeah. What is scientific enough? Okay, good. Because uh, you have pre-analytical... Yeah, of course. Well, that's why we have philosophy of science. ...of what is uh, a, a relevant narrative yeah. about the external world. Yes, that's true. Then you have models that depend on your choice of narratives That's right. yeah. and, and so on. So we are now trapped into this scientific enough yes. that assume that non-tangible things do not exist, which is 
totally absurd. Uh, yeah. uh, but I mean, so we should be careful with the discussion of what is scientific enough. Okay. Because where, look where we are, uh -huh. uh, let alone these type of things with sustainability science, no? Okay. We want to do the circular economy against the entropy yes. law. Uh, we, we are now in a situation mm. of total disaster in sustainability science mm -hmm. because we are going with the scientific we are using ontologies that are totally irrelevant and unable to deal. So what's the alternative? We, we, exactly. But I don't know. But I mean, to try to, science, for example. No, what I'm saying, to rediscuss what we mean with scientific enough. But this is, the, I mean, the, the, this question could be discuss it in this context, which I can explain. Or the system in general. No, let's say in general. Ah, in, gen in general. The discussion of post oh, Fine. In general, that's why we have a philosophy of science where you have different schools, but I think I'm not going to adopt a postmodernist way of looking at science that everything goes. I am not. No, no everything goes, yeah, no. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't... If, if the, if, Second sorry, question, sorry. to finish. Yeah. Oh. Could you just define recursion in this context? Yes, uh, yes. recursion is... I'm, if, well, if I'm... Yeah, well, yes. Because if you have an embedded, for example, uh, clauses, one inside another, you can you have recursion indefinitely. For forever. For example, if I say, uh, um, I am happy, then I could say, I can take this sentence and make it within another sentence. I said, my father thinks that I'm happy. My neighbor thinks that my father thinks that I'm happy. I, in principle, I can go on. Uh, you mean in nature? Definition, but you said it was everywhere. Ah, you mean how it could be everywhere. Uh, in this context. A definition, if you have embedded clauses, if you have embedded, for example, sound, you have recursion. If you have embedded forms, you have recursion. So, for example, uh, the songs uh, of, of birds or, uh, sorry, he's looking at me, he said, shut up. So I shut up. <laughs> Thank you.